Once upon a time, there was a group of dads who started playing D&D. This is their story. Hello and welcome back to D&D with Dads. The gang has all returned. Um, in the last episode, they had they finally were granted their audience um, with the king who sleeps. And, and the king was not awake, of course, um, but his caretaker, uh, Akiri, who also happens to be the mother of Riff, um, his steward uh, interpreted uh, the king's wishes to grant three special requests um, to each member of the party. And um, you guys having received some very interesting things based on your requests, you now have all that you desire. Um, Akiri tells you that uh, upon closing your eyes and concentrating, you will be drawn into um, the place that you desire to go, where you will then find what it is that you seek. So all of you have these objects, these things, um, and she walks down the stairs. We need to find a place where we can rest in a tune. Three. Should we ask if there's a, a, you know, a place that we could have, we could stay for a long rest equivalent time? Do we need a long rest? I have no idea. A two, I mean, if we're going to learn about these objects, I don't think it takes a full long rest. How long does it take to a tune? I believe an hour. Okay. Do you stop Akiri before she walks down the stairs? Yes, we do. We do. She she stops and she turns and, and she says, go to the white room. Okay. Where is the white room? What was there. <laughs> I close my eyes. <clears throat> okay. You guys see um, Humphrey disappear. Later, suckers. Riff immediately closes his eyes and concentrates as well. Okay. As presumably each one of you close your eyes, you appear in this limbo space. Um, you can feel that there is a floor underneath you. Um, it is perfectly white all around you but you can't quite see where the ceiling or the walls are. It's like a room that goes off in every direction. The only thing that you could see though is what's immediately below you, which is a white floor. But you are all there. I would like to start a tuning. Okay. A tuninizing, I assume is the technical term. Um, which item would you like to attune to? Let's go with the crystal ball of guidance. Okay. The moment you think of the crystal ball and you look at it, you understand that you can refer to it <clears throat> for insights and that it will reveal things to you, but that others will not see what you see. Do I sense any sort of limitations to the number of uses? Do you? That is what I'm asking you. Yes. Is... And and the question that you think of as you ask that in your mind. I should never have asked. <laughs> is do you? So. I mean, I, I don't I don't want there to be any limitations. I would like to use as much as I can. Then you don't believe that there are any limitations. <laughs> okay. I'll let everybody else take their turn here before okay. I go on to the next one. Um, Tuco, you begin to understand that your bracers of defense grant you um, a much needed boost to your armor class. And that basically, uh, mechanically speaking, that as long as you are engaged in combat and you truly, truly believe in the um, 
in the importance of that combat, whether you are on the offense or defense, that those bracers will grant you a bonus to your abilities in combat. So just the, the armor class bonus. Is that what you believe? As far as you know. <laughs> <laughs> you also grow a tail. <laughs> <laughs> well, I believe my uh, my swords can be a defense as well as offense. Okay. Um, Riff, your concerns about Akiri's longbow are in your mind. You, you've you never really practiced with a longbow, so you have the longbow in your hand, and you have this empty quiver in your hand. What do you do? When I study the, the uh, designs on the longbow, I'm pretty sure there's some carvings into it, and I try to read them. Yes, there are. There are carvings in Elvish. I read the... Uh, I read it out loud so everybody can hear. You guys all hear um, Riff saying words that you don't understand in any language. Um, I but say, Riff, hey, Riff. Riff, you <laughs> completely understand what you're reading. It totally makes sense that as long as you believe in yourself that this bow will not likely fail you. Say, so, Riff, if you need arrows, I have arrows. <laughs> I also um, take out my short bow and hold it to the, the long bow. And I feel that they, I think that they're pretty much the same. Like if I'm proficient with one, I'm proficient with the other one. There's a part of your mind that is very, very certain that Akiri's longbow is thousands times better than your shortbow. Yeah, I immediately just toss my shortbow over my shoulder and forget about it. Um, you have this leather quiver with a strap. <clears throat> the leather quiver also has uh, elvish runes inscribed on it. And I read that as well. Again, you guys hear Riff speaking in nonsense words that make no sense to any of you. Riff, you come to understand that this quiver, if you wear it with righteousness, that it will never fail you. Bummer. Righteousness. <laughs> okay. I strap it over my shoulder. Okay. You look back over your shoulder, you don't see anything in there. It's still an empty quiver. I am. Um, without looking, I just reach in. You grab waving, the end of an arrow. And I string it on the bow. It's there. Right, I put it back in the quiver. Okay. And then look in it. There's nothing there. What if you want more than one? You guys at no point saw any arrow. Even when he pulled oh, no. it out and you saw him pull the string back, you didn't see any arrow. So he just looks like a crazy person. Yes, yeah, so he's crazy. Got it. It's a bow of insanity. Yes, Estrop, <laughs> you have a very vivid imagination there. I'm glad you um, see that Dur arrow. Durant, uh, you're looking at that lump of clay. Yeah, what I, are you I, thinking about when you look at that lump of clay? So I'm, I'm looking at the clay, and I'm thinking about the forms that it could potentially take. What's an example of a form that it would take? Uh, perhaps a key? As you're thinking about it, the clay molds into a key. What? It kind, of looks, it kind of looks like the key to your room at the inn. 
back in town um, where like Blingo and and Twig are. That's slick. Okay. Um, Be more excited, Eric. This is so awesome. I, I try to, <laughs> I try to then see if I can push the limits in in terms of size, and I think of um, like a, a, an elephant statue. It appears in your hand as an Does elephant it statue. Crush my hand? <laughs> no, it's about that big. Okay, so if I think about something, if I think about it maybe growing 50% in size, does it change size? You feel like it does. Uh, it gets a little bigger and a little heavier. But you're not sure if it can go much bigger. Okay. Uh, and then I, I see if I can form it in, into a shield as well. It's, it begins to take the form, but it gets to be about the size of a small buckler. Okay. I, uh, I pocket the clay for now. Okay. It, it kind of shrinks back into the clump. Um, Estroff, you have a magical diadem. You feel like this, like this is somehow, like it could provide you with insights and wisdom that has been collected. What are you thinking about as you are wearing this diadem and thinking about Hmm. I'd say I'd probably be thinking about where we're at right now. You know, what it could possibly be. Make an arcana roll with advantage. With advantage. Nice. I've got a 12. <laughs> um, you feel like you are in a place that is between physical realms and other places and that this is most definitely a magical experience that you were having the closest thing that you could liken it to is that strange cusp of reality between the material plane and the Feywild which you doesn't seem anywhere near familiar to when we saw that Dryad or a little bit. Whatever she ended up being when she disappeared? A little bit, yes. Okay. Um Humphrey. I guess we're doing the um what are we doing? I'm thinking of the little clock thing. Yeah. So I, I remember thinking about this and thinking that that's for something that I could pause time, start and stop, and I could I could use it multiple times. Uh, As you're thinking about that, everyone around you freezes. Excellent. I'd like to peace out at that point. No, I'm just kidding. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and that's how we end this session of TNT with Dad. And, <laughs> and that is the end of the entire series of TNT with <laughs> Dads, everyone. In I rob them and animation. I leave. <laughs> Humphrey becomes the mage who never dies. Yeah. Yes. Bye. Um, okay, and then I'd like to think about starting it back up. Like time it, resuming. It does. That's amazing. That is actually super duper. Cool. Um, all of you guys notice that something strange happened. Humphrey like went from one position to another position. In like a millisecond. He he basically did a jump cut in front of you. All wearing of my diagram. Wearing no, the diagram. Can I figure it out? Around, basically, he was pr playing around with this clock, and then like looks like I moved. A, a millisecond later, like he was putting the clock in his pocket, but you didn't see him go from this 
down. It just was like from this to like that. You'll have to teach me that trick sometime, friend. Play your cards right, you know. Happy to. Um, Tuco, do you want to play with the wooden box of chess pieces or the red boots of teleportation? So first, I kind of want to, like, get away from people a little bit, and then I want to practice my forms while my, my bracers are on. Go through the different, you know, katas and... Let me ask you a question. Did you put the red boots on? No, at this time I just had the, okay. the bracers on, and I was All trying right. to stay away from people. You practice. You step away from, from your friends a bit, and you're wearing the bracers, and you have your swords, and you are moving fluidly through all of your forms. And when I get to a point where I'm um, exhausted, I want to sit down, take a break, um, bring out the chess pieces, and look at each one of the, the individual pieces. Okay. Each piece that you have um, is clearly representative art. You know, it's not it's not like a detailed miniature. You know what I'm saying? It's more like abstracted. But each one of those pieces, it is clear to you who each person is or who each little chess piece represents. Um, there are, however, complete, you know, it's a, it's a complete chess set. So while your friends all represent different pieces, the other pieces basically are just representative um, symbolic pieces. You know, so are like, the symbolic pieces like, like a king or a you know rook? Yeah, most of most of them are pawns. Um. So like you know, there's there's, uh, let me see. Seven. So you have seven unique pieces, right? Because there's the five of you guys, plus uh, Blingo and Twig. So that leaves nine remaining pieces that are um, I'm going to take one of, well, first I want to take um, the Estroff piece Yeah. and look at it and think about Estroff. Okay. I also and I want to think, Estroff. think to myself that um, liquid container that he got i wonder if that has uh hot tea in it as well um hmm. roll percentile dice did you just try to sober up estroff <laughs> how dare you sir <laughs> i bid you good day Fifty-three. Um, you are not sure. Hmm. Um, riff. Yeah. Silver blanket or the harp. So riff, uh, riff is looking kind of agitated, and he's looking at the the bow and the quiver, and he puts him, he sets them down gently, and he's like, "What have I done? I didn't. I, I guess I didn't believe Dak." my mother would actually be here. And I guess that's why I asked my first item to be something that belonged to my mother. Now she knows that I'm here. She probably was fine never having known me. So Riff is all very agitated and um, he reaches for the harp and um, he starts playing it, believing that maybe he can play something that'll calm himself down. At this moment. Mama. Ooh. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> All right. And he glares at Estrof. You calm everyone else down except yourself. <laughs> everyone feels calm. Like there's just something about the melody, you know, slightly sad melody uh being played by riff but you all feel a sense of calm like coming over you um 
All right, this brings us to Durant. Uh, I'll go necklace next. Okay. You put the copper heart necklace on. Um, you feel a warmth come over you. Um, it is a warmth that you are not certain you've ever felt. And you feel yourself tearing up. Knowing that you have never felt truly unconditional love. This feeling that you have gives you um, a sense of confidence about yourself that you are now actually accepted and loved. And um, a sense of courage. Uh, do I notice any impacts to anyone around me? Like, um, I'll, I'll casually walk by Riff while he's playing the harp. Okay, you casually walk by him. What else? Uh, I, I guess I, I'm just trying to see if, like, others feel the, the warmth. You don't uh, see anyone feeling the warmth. <laughs> right. Hey Riff, uh, do you, do you feel anyone? Do you feel any different? Nope, I'm still feeling a little bit upset about things. Thank you very much. Hey, so do I, but not as much. Thank you. Uh, make a persuasion check, Durant. Okay, persuasion. This will be interesting. At a minus one, uh, that's an eleven. You feel like, like, uncharacteristically to yourself, you feel like what Riff needs more than anything else is not just your words. He, he needs, like, a, 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 the human touch. He needs to know the, the support, Hug. love, and warmth that you feel. All right, so, so I'm going to awkwardly move in and give him like a side hug as awkwardly as humanly possible riff, riff immediately <laughs> riff immediately pulls him in thanks bro thanks bro i need that and he's like not letting him go it is it is riff holds him awkwardly durant, too wrong because durant feels it feels so strange and you're 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 metacognitively aware of this like you durant is aware of how odd this is but you feel the warmth, like not burning in pain, but like emanating from you. And as you do the awkward side hug, Riff, you suddenly feel that it's not wrong and that this is exactly what your mother would have wanted. That she, that your mother loves you and that your mother is happy that you have this this brother, this half brother to to share your life with. This feels right. Riff looks at Riff looks at uh Durant appreciatively says, Thanks, bro. I needed that. Kisses him on the top of the head and then pushes him away. Yeah. And you, and, you, and you get a mouthful of hair. You're reassured by by this feeling. Um Estroff, you have a pair of dainty spectacles and you have um a wine bottle yep still wine right <laughs> it is do you check it yes yeah, the second that i remember the bottle i want to take a swig what kind of wine would you like to have the most i would like the wine from our first episode that when i tasted it it was supposed to be the best I've ever had, and I haven't found better since. When you drink from from this bottle, it is precisely that wine. It has a a, a fruity initial flavor with a, a floral kind of bouquet to it, and and an aroma, um, and a a not too dry. Um, 
aftertaste. Finish. Yep. It, it's it's finish is is smooth. It's not too dry, and it's not too sweet. It's not like a port wine. It's just it's got just the right finish. It's an all around wine. I want to see if I can try to beat the magic. Um, you do. The you get alcohol pull, poisoning. The second pull that you take <laughs> of this is even better. I might have a problem, guys. <laughs> um, yeah, Humphrey, box. <laughs> Humphrey, Humphrey, your last object is a plain-looking hammer. I would like to think about this hammer. It's probably just a hammer. You think about it. The handle is made of wood. It looks sturdy but worn. The iron head of this hammer looks uh it's it's got some pock marks of you know age um just a tiniest little bit of like rusting you know over time it's it's a worn but sturdy hammer is this something that i could think about the hammer and the crystal ball together to see if there's insight that can be gained out of it do you hold both in your hands and think about that? That sounds like a great start. Yeah. So you start to look in the crystal ball as you're holding the hammer. And what are you kind of thinking about? What are you I'm, wondering about? I'm thinking about, you know, we're finally uh, dealing with this mage. And how am I supposed to defeat it with just a hammer? Hmm. Make an arcana check with advantage. Oh boy. Or a medicine check to see what it would do to his body. <laughs> uh, 24. Okay. So you are not a diviner, but because of your knowledge of magic, your study of magic, you have come to understand that oftentimes divination requires a process of deduction, of asking questions that are binary in nature and then deducing from those questions. So you feel as if if you ask a series of three questions that can be answered in yes or no, that you can deduce what it is that you seek. Oh boy. I'm going to put some, some thought into this. Okay. As you are contemplating this, um, Tuco, you you still have your wooden box of chess pieces, um, and you have the red boots. I'm going to put the boots on, and I'm going to feel like real militaristic, because I'm a samurai warrior type thing. Yes. And I'm going to start walking just in a random direction. And I'm going to stop and kind of salute and click my heels together three times and think of my friends. Okay. Kind of a, like a Nazi salute almost with the boots. Um, as you click, you find yourself back in the circle of friends. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Yes, Tuco walks away, and then he appears a moment later. Um, I see Humphrey standing there with his hammer, and I say, hey, are you going to hammer in the evening, too? And in the morning, and at seven. <laughs> That's right. Hammer time. Um, That's right. Estroff, Stop. Let's see. Uh, no, sorry. Riff, um, the blanket. Yeah, Riff. Uh, hey, Estroff, um, you look cold over there, my friend. Why don't you bring that bottle over and come... Come join me here under my new blanket I'm testing out. Get your drink. Like a blanket. Hammer out of danger. Uh, the blanket is surprisingly light and cozy and comfortable. Um, you don't actually feel any elements in the white room. There is really no climate one way or the other. But it does feel cozy. And you, you get a sense that wherever you are, that this blanket would help you feel comfortable. 
I wonder I wonder how uh, how many people I could cover with it if I want and I kind of do it like a like it's a cape and pull it over and see how how much well, area it easily it covers. covers you and Astroff easily what uh, if it could make you feel comfortable even in the fire of a dragon well you don't have any fire with you right now to try <laughs> that out but um Durant you are down to a scarf let's do it how do you study the scarf or put it on or wear it uh i'm going to wrap it around my neck several times and leave it hanging to the floor so it looks absolutely ridiculous okay uh and then i'm just going to sort of look at the threads and, and try to see you know how well crafted it is um first of all it's extremely well crafted secondly it makes a tight strange pattern that almost seems to shift as you as you try to study it so when you're not like studying it it just looks like a normal kind of zigzag um yarn you know uh crochet pattern or whatever right but if you try to study it in detail it seems to shift um what are you thinking about as you are studying it um i'm thinking about um well, thoughts, thoughts that I don't intend are, are really intruding in, in my head as I'm, I'm doing this, right? So um, I'm thinking of Dak and I'm thinking of the fact that, you know, maybe I was too hard uh, on my father, um, you know, by, by giving him the cold shoulder. And I'm trying and, and I'm reflecting, even though I'm trying to push these thoughts away, they're, they're sort of coming in as I'm studying this. Um, as you're thinking about that, you hear a voice behind you, and it is the voice of Dak. Um, you look over your shoulder. Yeah, I, I, I'll do that. So Dak is standing there, and uh, he's kind of just wearing simple clothes, and he. He says, Durant, don't beat yourself up, son. It's not your fault. You're a good boy. I'm proud of what you were able to do. You've done so much with your life. But I had to have done something to make you want to go away. No. No, son, it's not your fault. I've always had a bit of a restless soul. I've been a bit of a fool. It's funny. I've never felt like a wise man, but if you ever have any doubts, I'm always here. I'm always here and I'll I'll try to answer any questions you have, son. And 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 what of Riff? I mean Arik. Trust your brother. He's got a good heart, and I don't think he'd ever leave you. It's good to know it's it's reassuring. Thank you. And then I turn uh, to, to Riff to see if he's seeing any of this. Nope. Um, this brings us <clears throat> to Estroff. So... I'm going to cork my wine bottle because at this point I've got a friend who's just pretending to pull arrows out of nowhere. Yep. Got another one who's kind of twitchy, another one who's just popping up in the middle of us, and another one talking to himself. Yes. So I'm questioning this wine <laughs> and I'm putting it back. I'm going to try my spectacles. Okay. 
you put on the spectacles. And um, everything has a slight kind of warm, kind of rosy color tone to it as you look at your friends. Hmm. You feel like none of these strange things are really all that strange. You look at when you have these glasses on and you, who, who do you look at first, I guess? Riff is the one who's closest to you. So I'll say that as Riff is playing around covering you guys and playing with blanket forts, um, you uh, look over at Riff and you see the friendship and trust that you have in him is just evident. Like there's almost like a glow around him. Um, but perhaps more importantly, you see in that quiver uh, 20 arrows. The sheaves of 20 arrows sticking out of that quiver. Hmm. Uh, Maybe I'm crazy as well. <laughs> then I go to Durant. Look at him next. You're. I'm going to say that you're looking at Durant, and he's like wearing this scarf, and you see him talking to someone, <clears throat> and you kind of do this, and over his shoulder, when you put the glasses up, you see Dak. And then you kind of take the glasses down and Dak's not there. Huh. How strange. Now I start looking at, at uh, I guess just everyone, trying to figure okay. out everything else that, that everyone else has been playing around with. When especially you look the at, ruby slippers. When you look at Tuco, you see that the bracers that he's wearing on his arms are glowing in a myriad of colors, as are the ruby boots that he's wearing. Um, you can't see the chess pieces because they're in the wooden box. Uh, when you look at Humphrey, you see that he is holding in one hand this crystal ball, which you see is glowing outside and inside of it has swirling smoke. And he's in the other hand, he's holding this plain looking hammer which looks plain until you do this. And when you put the glasses up, the hammer is glowing brighter than anything you've ever seen. You're almost blinded by it. Like God level power of brightness. And when you have the glasses on, it doesn't look like a plain old worn hammer. When you have the glasses on, it is the most polished steel you've ever seen. Like a mirror. Um, the hammer is like perfectly silver and, and mirrored and glowing like white light is just pulsing out of it. Gods! That's some hammer you got there, Humphrey. Ah, if you have any information, I'd love to know more. I've, I've it, got the, it, yeah. It's very bright. Good to know. Um, at this point, all of you have had a chance to attune to. I got my questions, Bill. Just, I don't know if it's too too late for that. No, it's not too late. You're okay. you're thinking about it. Yep. So holding my hammer, and now that I know the hammer is bright, I've got I got four questions, but I think you'll only let me ask three. Um, so I guess first and foremost. Um, you know, I guess I, you know, I'm thinking, do I use this hammer to break something, which is the source of the mage's power? Yes. Okay. You feel a definitive swirl within the crystal ball emanating like an affirmative. Okay. Second then... question. Is it his face? <laughs> right. <laughs> wow. Okay. So, um, uh, do I is the hammer magical also affirmative yes oh shit all my other questions are 
Okay. Um, is there a way that I can activate the power of the, the magic? Uh, yes. Okay. Permanent. So be it. I'll have to figure out how the hell to use The this. crystal ball smoke inside the crystal ball is still swirling. Gosh, uh, the other thing I was thinking of was, you know, is the hammer used to build something that would lead to the demise of the mage? But answering the first question. No. Kind of, no, all right. You, you sense, you, you think this question and you see the first dark turn of the smoke in the negative. Is, does the hammer allow, the hammer allow me to cast or, you know, perform magic? I guess I'm trying to figure out a question that can help me lead to the, the concept of, you know, is the hammer inherently magical like a plus one sword would be? Or is it actually like, is this like a flute that makes me fly? Your brain starts to think of these things and the color of the smoke swirls and swirls <laughs> and then it just stops. Okay, <laughs> we'll call it a day with this one then. <laughs> but you, for a moment, you felt like there was no limit to the number of questions you could ask. And then, and then your brain the started to, your brain started to work through everything at, at super speeds, and it just like the smoke kind of coalesced and went into kind of a, a dormant state. Okay, so be it. You uh, don't give up. When, <laughs> when I got back to my friends, I wanted to look at my chess pieces again. I wanted to set. I'm assuming since there's a white and black on the case that the case would open up and, and make a chess board. Did you try that? That's what I want to try for okay. first. You open up the case and a a pattern appears. And I want to start setting up the pieces of my uh, party and uh, Twig and Blingo as well. Um, and as I'm setting them up, I'm thinking about our goal of um, one thing. Just one thing to note. So you have 16 pieces on your in your case. Um, and you have, let me, let me just go through this one more time. So there are, you have seven of you guys plus eight. I'm on there too. Yeah. Right. So it's, it's, it's the, Five of you plus Blingo and Twig, right? So that makes seven, seven unique pieces plus the eight pawns. And as you're setting up your side, you set up the eight pawns where uh, you, you are going to decide where you want to place your other pieces, but you realize that you only see 15 pieces total, right? There's the eight pawns and then there's the seven of you. So there's not the enemy set. You don't see anything in your set. Pardon me? You don't see anything for the other side in your set. Other side. Okay. So I'm kind of setting up the pieces, just kind of at random, setting us at the back, starting to set the pawns up towards the front. And since I'm also thinking about the, uh, the tower, uh, the thought that comes into my mind is that the, the the party um, before we joined w was um, going to the, the mage tower at the bidding of a some kind of uh, other magician. And I'm kind of thinking about him as I'm placing uh, the pawn down. Okay. Um, a question. You, you place your pawns across your, your front row. Um, who do you place where on your back row? If you're standing behind your, if you're sitting behind your board. Um, so you, you've got your pawns up front, um, your, your positions, your, your rooks, your knights, your bishops, 
and your king and queen. That's that's basically what I want to know. Like, who are you putting where? So Durant, I'm going to have um, the part of the one of the bishops. Um, Humphrey, I'll have as the king. Uh, Riff, I'll have as the queen, and then Estroff, I'll have as a, one, one of the rooks. Okay, uh, that leaves Twig and Blingo. Twig and Blingo. Um. So, Twig will be the other um, rook, and Blingo will be the other bishop. Okay. Uh, at this point, I am going to step over to Tuco. And I'm going to rest. Sorry, Tuco, you still have yeah, that's fine. You could step over. You're still you still have your piece, Tuco. And there are two knights open. I'll be a uh, knight. That's perfect. Okay. And Durant, you're stepping over, you're kind of looking at him doing setting this up. And I'm going to rest a hand on, on his shoulder. <laughs> and I'm going to say Brave heart, Tuco. You'll figure this out. <laughs> um, you finish placing the pieces. You guys all see Tuco laying this out on this board. Um, and you see that, that the way he's laid it out, he has pawns all up front. Um, Durant as a bishop, Lingo as a bishop, Humphrey as a king, Riff as a queen, Estroff as the rook. Twig as a rook and Tuco as a knight. There's still one knight position open. And there's no dark pieces on the other side. Is there another knight piece anywhere to be found? No. So maybe the knight, the other knight piece would be the, that I'm thinking, what I'm thinking about for the, uh, that magician that was wanted us to defeat the mage's tower because he's the one that you know started this mission what about red trish i don't know if tuco's ever met her though was she the one that the um the bar the tavern we came in yeah like yeah. real red hair and yeah, yeah, I remember she's a seven echo, but I don't remember like what her name actually is. Marissa. Marissa, right. I met her briefly. Actually probably more than I met the the master, but I, I only heard you talking about him, but I just know that he's the one that's kind of positioning us to to defeat the, the mage's tower, get into the mage's tower, I guess was his directive. Do we have the positions wrong of the pieces? Um, are I you need insight. Thinking that, Durant? What's that? Are you thinking that? I, I. Or are you literally asking it out loud? I asked out loud, yeah. I said, I'm just kind of trying to figure this um, thing out. I don't know. I'm just kind of figuring out what th things are supposed to be where. You, you hear the voice of Dak over your shoulder say, well, son, I'm I'm not the most learned man, but tell you what, uh, I don't know if I'd make your goblin minion a bishop. He doesn't seem like the brightest bulb in the bunch. I, I think you have this one in, in the wrong place, and I point to to Blingo out loud to to go. Where do you think would be best? Try, try a knight. A knight. Okay, then I can switch me with with him. I well, was a knight. You have two knights. 
Oh, all right. Yeah, I'll put him, I'll put the uh, Blingo as the other knight. Okay, so you put Blingo into a knight position. You're in the other knight position. That opens up a bishop. What if? Just thinking about this this out loud. You've identified Shem as being the person who directs us. Maybe he's the king after all. Yeah, I was just um, putting Humphrey there because he's kind of my master for now, but I you are right. For him. Shem is, is even higher at this point than, than Humphrey. So yes, let's try... We'll put him there. Put Humphrey where? Humphrey will be the other rook. Is that one? Bishop. And then Shem will be the king. How are you going to make Shem? You move Humphrey to the bishop position. Mm -hmm. So you hear this conversation? Rick and uh, uh, Riffin. I'm assuming at this point, since you all have assimilated with your, or not assimilated, but, you know, come to. Uh, an understanding of of your different objects that you're kind of watching um, Tuco kind of sitting on the floor of the white room with this chess set. Um, He currently has all of the pawn pieces up front. He has Durant in a bishop piece. He has Humphrey in a bishop piece uh, position, sorry. Um, He has Lingo and himself in knight positions. He has Twig and Estroff in uh, Rook positions, and he has Riff in the Queen position. I'm going to ask Durant if he thinks, do you think this, by setting these up, this is going to be something permanent, or am I able to move these around? Because it doesn't appear to be any instructions that came with this to, to show who is what. I'm just kind of setting things up, just trying to figure things out. Uh, I'm gonna make an Arcana check if that's allowed. And I wanna, I wanna think about it too, with my pretty little dad in. So. Okay. Um, Durant, your Arcana check. Go ahead and make that. Astroff, um ask me, or, or tell me what kind of questions you're thinking about with regard to this. Uh, so uh, I got a 22. My roll is a 13. Voice. Okay, uh, so Durant, you you are certain that these are magical. You your instinct is that this is that the placement is important, that somehow it will unlock or reveal something, but you're not exactly sure what the arrangement should be or how it works. Uh, Estroff, what are you thinking about as you ponder this? I'm thinking about how similar the game pieces are to us, and see maybe how rough they are. Maybe if something was easy to manufacture, like say maybe out of chalk or clay. I had that thought. Um, I just don't want to swear fealty to someone who we think is an enemy. Yeah, that would not be a Durant thing. Estroff, you feel like there's something magical about the pieces, but also about the box. I put on my buy spectacles and look at the box. Yeah, you feel like if these pieces went back into the box, that there's the ability to change things. Tuko, I, I just want you to try one thing. Could you put them back in? Maybe think about a different setup and then open it back up. Okay, I'm going to try and take the pieces out and think of um, resetting back to the beginning as I put them back in their spots. Okay. Close the pieces. We're going right. to see Acker. <laughs> um... <laughs> Holy shit. Tuco, do you you put them back in the box, you close the box. What what do you think about then? I 
a new game is going to start. It's it's ready for a new game. Okay. Who do you see being in that game? Oh. <laughs> nah, I won't do that. Um. Now I want to know what you were thinking. <laughs> I'm going to uh, just keep, you know, my party, my friends, because that's what I saw before. Just thinking that, you know, my friends are ready to um, assist um, in the quest, however we need it. So the exact same setup as you had before. Just name name who. Durant. Oh yes, the same people. Because that's what I had before. I'm, I'm just going to assume that they're going to be the same people, but maybe they could be in different positions because it's a new game. Yeah. So you open up the box and all the same pieces are there. So it looks like we're ready. Not for sure, it would change. Maybe it's about who you think about. You're only thinking about allies. Maybe you need to think about enemies too. Were you only thinking about us? I was only thinking about us. But and I was also thinking about the, the Shen guy, but I don't know if he is our ally or if he... He's not. Our enemy. Oh, I was going to say, I was going to be Acker for a second, but... I think we were supposed to double cross them, right? That was the plan. Yeah, so he's not an ally. Is there anyone else you would consider your ally, Tuko? Well, my my master, but I haven't been able to find him. Well, well, maybe this could help you find him. Maybe you think about all the people that are your allies, like us and your master. I give it a try. I think about us. I think about my master, the training he's been through, and open up the case. Um. Okay, so you're thinking about your master, Durant, Humphrey, Riff, Estroff, um, Twig and Blingo, Twig and Blingo, yep. and yourself, and myself. Okay. Or do All you right. consider yourself an ally? You <laughs> you open up the case, and this time you have eight pieces. No pawns. No, you have, I'm sorry, you have the eight pawns, and then you have eight unique pieces. The newest of which is a symbol of what looks like an elf with two swords. Yeah. Do I get any feeling when I look at the, the piece of my master that I can communicate with him or talk with him or anything like that? Um, no. So we've got these pieces and it seems to be the positioning is important. I don't know if we want to spend all day studying this. Maybe it is best to move on before we try and set pieces in place and, and try and figure this out more when we have time again. Okay. Unless anyone else has any other ideas. I've got too many ideas. We can't try them all right now. <laughs> yeah, so, so. Yeah, there are a billion combinations of what we've just done that are just going to mess up our world. I'm over here like, what if you think about eight S troughs? Uh, <laughs> I was thinking um, about our red shirts, but yeah. Oh my God. Do you, Tuco, do you pack it up and put it back in the box again? Is there, yes. well, is there a question that you guys, a yes or no, that I can for help? perhaps help answer with this ball of guidance? Well, the question I have is if I set them on the, in a position, 
does that seal them in that position? Can I try that with a ball, Bill? Um, you could. Let's try this just for as an experiment. Can I hand the ball over and uh, yeah, and then let him have a try? You're going to give the ball to Tuco? Yeah, to Tuco. The ball explodes. No, it doesn't. It becomes a chest set. You're, you're holding. <laughs> you, do you take the crystal ball? Yeah, I take the crystal ball. Okay. I look at it. What, what should I do? What did, what did you do with it? I, I think about, I just think about a yes or no question. And the answer appears in the form of smoke. Okay, so I look at it and I think, you know, if I place these posi- these pieces in a um, position, does that lock them in place? Um, I look at the ball and see if there's any you're smoke. You're staring or- at the ball. You see the smoke swirling around. Um, Humphrey, you see the smoke turn very dark in a negative response. So I say, do you, do you see, do you see this Tuco? Do you see? I you think see I smoke see. inside of the crystal ball. Okay. Well, I see it, it, what it tells me is, is painfully clear. I don't know why you, you're not seeing this, but it is, it is, uh, it, it's a, a clear no, whatever you asked. I'd say kind of like condescendingly in my gruff <laughs> sort of fashion. Like, how do you not well, see this, you dummy? You know? Tuco, can I see the rift piece? Can I hold it? Ask it Ask it this. Will and the board grant you control over the battlefield? Will the board... Uh, I, think, I think will the board give me control over the battlefield um all of you see the same kind of slow swirling smoke inside of the crystal ball humphrey you again see a clear dark definitive negative answer i look around at everybody like anybody like out of like come on guys this is you know you guys aren't seeing an obvious reply here and i just look and see everybody's bewildered faces and i'm like oh, no it says no uh, Astroff, you actually see the same thing that Humphrey sees. That Humphrey sees. Yeah, it it turned black twice. He said no the first time. And, Thank uh, you, jeez. Yeah. You've so, been drinking plenty of that out of that canteen there, Astroff. <laughs> so so Riff Riff has um, the Riff piece in his hand that. Uh, that Tuco gave him, and he hold, he holds it in the palm of his hand and puts it right like near the the chessboard, and he tries to will the rift piece to sort of move on its own to see if he can get it to go where it should go. What place do you put it? Oh, you're not even putting it on the board. No, I'm just I'm just holding it in the palm of my hand near the board and just willing it to you, walk under the board and go to the rest. Concentrate, rest. and nothing happens. I hand it back to Tuco. Can I see his intent when he's trying that? Yes. <laughs> I want to cast Minor Illusion to make it look like it's slightly moved. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> you do. I disbelieve uh, the feeble illusion. Um, <laughs> <laughs> All right. So you, uh, yeah, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem, your piece does not seem to want to react to what you will. I think it matters where where we place them on the board, but I haven't figured out what the different positions mean yet. Yes. It's uh, like having a game that you don't know the rules to. Yes. Precisely. What did you ask for before you got the game board? What was your request? To be able to communicate with my with my friends and family talk to one of them (laughs) i tried i tried talking to you while i was over there yell louder (laughs) 
<laughs> it's it's what going if to you, work. You just have to believe it. Just just try it. I'll, what if you I'll, think I'll go over here and I like run away. <laughs> <laughs> what if you think toward Esteroth instead of speaking out loud while holding that particular piece? What? What if you think about Esteroth while he's over there while holding his piece? It's hard not to think about Esteroth holding saying. pieces. Yes. <laughs> Well, while Estroth is over there, I'm going to look at Durant's piece, and I'm going to think, who is this uh, Alyssa Honey Doofus you keep asking about? You you look at Durant's piece and think that? Yep. Nothing happens. You're just looking at it, like, in the case, right? Well, I have them out in my hand. Well, oh, I didn't. Yeah. Can you... Can you ask the ask the I, crystal ball if you can use if you can communicate with the pieces to talk to people in real life? You see an affirmative swirl of bright colored smoke inside of the, the ball when you ask when you think about this question, Humphrey. This thing is yes. I give it back. I give it back. <laughs> what if what if you need two pieces to communicate? So, in other words, like oh, two Durant. <laughs> now kiss. <laughs> <laughs> Bill's like, oh my god, I hate these people so much. <laughs> put, put the pieces back in the box and think about having two of each piece. And maybe that's the key. Two of each piece. Well, maybe if you think about, maybe we think about in a game of chess, who goes first, right? And maybe those who are eligible to go first are able to speak first to one another. I don't know. Never mind. This was a half-baked idea. It's not terrible. Okay. To be clear, do you have the pieces out, like where you're holding them in your hand, or do you have them in the wooden box? I have um, Estroff and Durant, and I guess myself in my hand. Okay. The other pieces are still in the box. Okay. And then what do you do or think of? I think, um, who is this Alyssa Honey Doofus that Durant keeps talking about? Okay. Um, Durant and Estroff, you hear Chuko in your minds telepathically asking you that question. I reply back. I don't know. Oh, it worked! It worked! <laughs> uh, and, and you just get like this stream of consciousness reply from Durant that's like, oh my god, she's the greatest ever. She writes these great books and, and details amazing things about dragons and it, it's amazing and here and you start getting pages of books like flying by in your head. Do I hear that in my head? Yep. Yes! It works! Now maybe some time to, to celebrate, Astra. You could talk to your master. <laughs> Ooh. This requires thought. I I remember that the king who sleeps said that he took my master so that he and turned him into a guardian or an enemy. So I don't know if it's wise to let him know that we are here yet. What do you think? Does his master, is it is it colored differently by my spectacles, the little piece for his master? Um, yes. So... I finally noticed this whenever you ask it, and I'm like, well, it's probably a good point. Maybe don't, maybe don't be so hasty. <laughs> My head is hurting from trying to figure out all these rules. I'm a soldier, not a, not a thinker. You just I need, need some, some good classes. <laughs> we have um, made progress. 
you guys are in the white room. Uh, you kind of, I, I'm assuming, do, do you, what do you do with the rest of the chess pieces in the chess board and box? Um, unless you guys have any other ideas, I think we should figure out where we are and where to go from here. So, real quick, before you put it up, I want to snatch Tuco's real quick and then think in my head, does it work this way too? No. I just stare at him. What? That's <laughs> <laughs> John spends the rest of the session staring directly at Tuco. <laughs> so, guys, we... I believe we left it where when we are ready they'll send us to the to the mage tower is that correct um, yes to the, to the maze to the maze to the maze Sorry, takes us I... to the mage tower right so is there is there anything that we want to do bef- that we need to do before that is there anything prep that we need to do we're all we're all rested and ready to go but I, I don't think we're going to be allowed to leave this room. Like once we get out of the white room, we're back in in the main area. I can take us home. You can take us home, but in the end, this this voice in my head is is not the same thing as as Dak in reality, and and I have unfinished business. Okay, so. Durant, are you coming with us to the Mage Tower? Of course. I'm, I'm, I'm in this. I just wish there was an opportunity to see the slaves before we go. Then, if, does anybody else have any unfinished business? No, I'm good. Well, not really. I mean, I used to think there were two roads we could go by, but in the long run, we'd still have the time to change the road we're on. Right now, it seems like there's one specific way that we need to go, and we're kind of gaining momentum. Okay. Um, and- you feel something odd. Lots of weapons. When 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 Riff refers to this, you feel something like um, emotionally or physically. Oh, so, like physically, <laughs> like the floor is no longer level. Like it has started to tilt. But you have that fly thing. Um, That's in the fly. Like it's it's sort of tilting in one direction. Hey, that might be our cue to leave. I I think, uh, yeah, I think it's now. I don't think we have another option. Okay, I want to close my eyes and think about returning to see if that does anything. Okay, you appear. Um on the great slab next to the sleeping king. Okay. Uh, All the rest of you guys are in the white room and the floor is tilting. And in maybe another three rounds, you're going to have to make athletics checks not to slide down the floor. Well, I mean, we're supposed to think his name, aren't we? Well, uh, I'm gonna open up my yeah. chest again and uh, bring out me and Humphrey and think about come back. We need you with us. Why do we need to be in the white room? We can leave whenever we want. You hear Humphrey in your head. You hear your friend calling for you. I return. I close my eyes and, and think about the white room again. Okay. And so I get uh, back and, and I and I say. Oh, sorry, I didn't let you finish. The The floor of the white room is on a 45 degree angle now. So I, I want to say, guys, why are we why are we here? We can we can enter the maze from the safety back where we came from. Why aren't we all leaving right now? Yeah, reason we're waiting? Riff, Riff concentrates on getting to the very start of the maze. OK, Riff disappears. Yeah, Durant, Durant is going to follow suit. And okay, so we are going to the maze. I thought we were not. I thought we were going to go do Durant's thing with the slaves first. I guess it's too late. Let's let's full send. Dur- All right, Humphrey disappears. Yep. 
Alright, I think about going wherever they went, even though I don't know where they went, just following. <laughs> you disappear. <laughs> Tuco, uh, make a, with you, uh, acrobatic. <laughs> Seven plus ten, twenty, uh, seventeen. Okay. Um, you are now, it's, it's, it's at about a 75 degree angle. So you, you can't just stand. You have to be constantly moving and running up. All right. I'm going to think about my friends and, and get, get into my friends. Make a arcana check before you disappear. Ten. Okay. Remember how I described the white room as a place where you just saw the floor and you never saw the walls in any direction or the ceiling? Yep. Just before you think of your friends, as you're like running up the hill, you glance over your shoulder and you see something other than the white floor because basically the white floor was almost at 90 degrees and it was becoming a white wall and you saw a shimmering endless lake of silver what looked like water but in it, it was like silver in liquid floor, form and then you appear next to your friends all of you guys are in front of a cave entrance the cave entrance is 30 feet tall it is um, it seems natural as if it's like a fissure uh, and the rock from which all of this is made is um, white kind of like a marble but it's very jagged and broken the cave itself uh, like what you know you're, you're standing in front of this entrance and there is a deep dense fog What do you do? Go in. I'm looking around with my spectacles. Um, there's nothing really to sense. Like nothing looks different with the spectacles on than with your your own eyes. It just seems like there's a a, a dense fog if you proceed into the cave. Uh, I'm going to make an investigation check around the entrance, uh, looking to see if there are any, if there's anything odd to see, like maybe runes or anything like that. Oh, okay. Go ahead, make an investigation check. Uh, that's a 24. Okay. You, you don't see around the entrance to the cave, but about... 10 feet into the cave just before the fog gets really too dense to kind of look through you see runes in giant carved into the ceiling uh looking at them do i get the sense that they're magical um are you using detect magic uh no. Uh, then no, they just seem like giant runes. Okay. Uh, Tuco, can you read that? And I gesture to the runes. Um, surprisingly, you can. They're runes in giant. And they say, Maze of the Sleeping King. Uh, tell them, this, I think this is the entrance to where we're supposed to be going. Mm. So there's a there's a sign on the wall that says this because we need to be sure. sure. It's not really it, a sign. It's just. And it says what? Uh, entrance to the maze of the sleeping king. No, it didn't say entrance. It just said maze of the sleeping maze. king. We're uh, at the finish. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I'm gonna take I'm gonna take a quick look around. Uh, sort of opposite that the cave entrance to see if there's any anything else around us. 
There is. Um, there's a vast, unending sea of rocky, icy outcroppings and snow. Is that the same silver sea I saw before I came in here? No. What you saw was pure, like, basically, like, imagine, like, mercury, right? Like, liquid, like, like, liquid silver, basically. Riff is standing at the the runes on the wall and like looking elsewhere around just to see if there's any other way um, besides this because it almost seems too obvious like it would just say here's the way to go or here's the maze. Estroff's already kind of sold so he's going to calmly walk in because <laughs> his glasses seem fine with it and the sign said we're here. Estroff there's that sign on the wall, but we need to be sure, because you know sometimes words have two meanings. So I just oh, want to make sure this, you know. But the glasses don't see anything. It's just foggy. Is there anywhere else to go? We can go that yeah, way. The lake, the lake the behind water. us. All right, Estroff. Can I have a swig on your bottle before I follow behind you? Oh yeah, you can have as much as you want. What's it taste like to riff? Um, like a very fine wine that you had one time when the traveling feeder troop um, came through a forest gnome Ballywick, uh and performed one of the best performances of that season and you guys were treated to some incredibly um, tasty uh, apple cider wine. Apple cider. Estroff, this is just like that time that Gnome Troop came to and we had that apple cider wine. This is amazing. No! The memories no, are flooding I, in. I, yes, try it. And I taste it. Does it taste like what he's talking about or what I originally tasted? It tastes like the greatest wine that you ever had, just like you imagined it before. Yeah, it's not that old stuff. Ah, you don't know your wine. Everybody else coming? Are you guys still taking a look around? I'm in. Let's do it. Uh, do I have any... Uh, I'm going to pull out a torch and uh, suggest maybe that we light a torch. Okay. For, you know, those of us who can't see... In the is dark. it dark in the cave? Um, it is now. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, really, it is now. All of a sudden, it's dark. Uh, once you light the torch, though, you could see just fine. Those of you with dark vision can also see just fine. So lighting the torch made it dark? Is that what I'm to? It seems like that's what happened. Huh. And it wasn't dark before. It was like daytime? Um, yes. It was like dark. daytime. That's unsettling. <laughs> Is I'm it still foggy? I'm so unsettled. <laughs> Daylight is better than, than candlelight. Turn off the torch. Yeah. Wait, I, I want to off button. Using Druidcraft, I'm going to cut out his torch and then cut it back on like a couple times and see what happens. Uh, you basically make the light flicker on and off all around you. Do it really fast, back and forth. Is it like cast? Like I'm, I'm trying to imagine a the reverse like you have a dark room and, or you have a light room and oh sorry imagine you have a dark room and you have a regular torch like it's going to it's going to radiate that that light and it and it will diffuse over a distance is it is that exact experience but the opposite so yes. he's like waving around darkness yes that's kind of cool i kind of want to have a flame blade now because it would look awesome right the darkness blade of Burning darkness. There's Blade, something else fire. that you notice when when he lights the fire. Uh, 
I will say that each one of you should make a perception check. I'm good at this. Any, this any is my bag here. Any bonus or anything? After one. Um, you can make yours, Mikey, at advantage. Yes. Well. 25. I got a 13. You got advantage? 18. 13 with the advantage? Those of you who had... Those of you who had a 20 or higher. I think it's just Durant, um, right? You notice that when Durant lights the torch, you know, it changes the lighting around you by the cave, but you notice something else. When the torch is lit, the area behind you is no longer a frozen wasteland. It's an enormous, unending sea of land that looks like summertime um and you can tell that based on where the moon is you kind of get a sense for directions so everyone else is looking into the cave because durant's the only one who <laughs> so, so I'm, I'm looking above at, at the moon and what does the moon tell me about direction like what would I be able to uh, it tells where? you that the going into the cave would be north. Okay. And going into the unending wasteland of summer. Which direction do you look? I'll I'll look south. Um, south in the distance you see a mountain, and it very much looks like the mountain of the sleeping king. Uh, and east and east next. Um, east, you see hills, forests, and then the very, very far east, um, you see the sun beginning to rise. Okay, and west. You look west and you see what seems to be. Tavalar. And when you look west, you have a feeling. And a part of you, your spirit, is is sad for leaving Tavalar and leaving Twig and leaving Lingo and maybe most of all for leaving Red Trish. Not think this through. <laughs> uh, and and as I look at Tavalar, and um, does it look? Is there anything distorted about it? Yes. What do you think is distorted the most about it? Uh, perhaps the walls have fallen? Oh, it's much worse than that. Tavalar has been absolutely destroyed. Everything is charred. The buildings, the walls, the corpses of every resident of Tavalar scorched earth. Even the woods around it scorched earth. And in the distance, in that forest, you know the forest to the west of Tavalar? Yes. You see rings of smoke, like through the trees. And you hear kind of like a chorus a strange, almost kind of ghostly chorus of voices. Do we see and this just as at well? The or... edge, just at the edge of this forest, you see kind of these spectral forms of what looks like the town folk of Tavalar, kind of looking at the desolation of what was Tavalar. 
looking at this scorched environment. Riff walks over and, and joins Drant. What do you see off to the west, brother? It's horrible. It's absolutely terrible. The the ruins of the ruins of Tavalar. And as you as you sort of watch the complexion kind of leaves Durant at, at this realization. And what's left are, are ghouls. Ghouls of everybody that was there left behind. And smoke. and chaos and destruction. I don't know if this is foretelling what will be or telling what is, but it is certainly frightening. Riff puts his hand on Durant's shoulder and says, there's a feeling I get when I look to the west with you. When my spirit is crying for leaving, I think we should be going. For if you say, if this is something to come, then we should make haste. And also, if it's already happened, we should probably also make haste and find out what's gone. That's a good point, brother. And the rest of us see it after he kind of told us exactly where to look? Yeah, you sure do. And it becomes there... it becomes clear to you as kind of like the smoke dissipates. Is it clear like through the glasses? Yes. That hurts. It didn't fix it. <laughs> Since we went to see the king who sleeps, things seem to be not what they once were. Things we think about become reality and things that aren't normally there start happening. Are we actually here or are we still there? I think these may simply be illusions. Are these the dreams of the king? Well, I know a way we can find out. Anybody uh, have a yes or no question I can ask? Are these yes. the dreams of the king? Yeah, I, I, I hold the crystal ball, pull it out, and I'm holding it, and I'm thinking, are these, is, is this, you know, are these the dreams of the king, what we're seeing? You think this, or you say it out loud? I'm thinking it. Um, the smoke within the crystal ball whirls. And it does not get brighter or darker. It then does I, not answer you. I think, I'll think, is this reality? Is this an accurate, is this actually what is happening in real life? Or is it, yeah. Or better yet, better yet, is this an illusion of the maze? So as you think that, you hear a rumble to the south from the mountain. I maintain focus on my question. <laughs> um, all of you hear this rumble and it's getting louder. You see a landslide of epic proportions rolling down the great mountain to the south of you, and it looks like the momentum it's picking up could reach you. Well. Maybe we should go. Guess yeah. The maze. Well, gentlemen, it's been hun fun hopping over these misty mountains, but I feel like we've gotten way sidetracked, and it's I must be partly to blame. Sorry for dragging all into this family business of, of Durant and mine, but uh, let's off. Is there a way to close the cave entrance once we're in to protect us? I think it's going to close itself. <laughs> <laughs> the last uh, guy is getting closer. Well, make haste, I guess. Estrof runs. Oh. Durant will take up the rear. I'll be up front with Estrof with my uh, dark vision. Who is the first person to go through the fog? I am. Okay. Um, each person to go through the fog make a wisdom saving throw. Do I get... Oh, wait a minute. 
Nice. 17. Nat 20. Okay. 14. Okay. 12. Wisdom saving throw. Where do I even see? Oh, there it is. Um, crud. Uh, seven. As you guys pass through the fog, you you smell um, you smell kind of like a a, a musk, like a, a an animal sort of musk. Um, like the kind of smell you'd smell if you were like at a, at a farm with cattle, just a like a very musky kind of smell of of animals. Um, you pass through the fog and you find yourselves now in this white cave. And the only light now is coming from the torch that Durant has lit. Those of you with dark vision seem to be able to see with your dark vision to the extent that you were able to see 60 feet ahead of you. Um, and this cave continues going straight forward for as far as you can see. Um, Give me your marching order one time. Who's up front? Up front with the fancy glasses. I'm right behind Estroff. Behind. I'm. I'll be anywhere if that fits in. I'll, I'm gonna good. go last. So. Estroff, Riff, Tuco, Humphrey, and then Durant. I'm up front, Humphrey. Okay. So, At least we establish a pocket for our squishy wizard tree. <laughs> um, you guys walk the the cave, I'm assuming? Yep. Astroff, what's your passive perception? It is a 13, but do the glasses or diadem help at all? Oh. In this case? Absolutely not. <laughs> <laughs> they hurt. <laughs> um... They, the glasses don't seem to do anything, but you hear the voice of a little old lady near your ears, kind of where the magical diadem sits on you. And it says, You're walking in a cave, boy. You're not made for caves and mazes. Why would you take point here? What kind of things might you might you encounter in caves, boy? Think. Use what's between your ears, dummy. I know, Grandma. <laughs> so I just slumped my shoulders and stepped to the side and kind of threw <laughs> it. <laughs> you got bullied by a voice in your head. <laughs> um, I want to hold the. Uh, I want to hold this crystal ball and say are we are we in danger in this room absolutely <laughs> this is fine this is this is fine <laughs> do you say that out loud or do you think it i think it and i i i'll tell the group you know I kind of now it's like a whisper and like stop and think you know we're, we're in danger in here i you know the crystal ball said i would take point but i can't see it in the dark um, Durant. Yes. You you hear your friends say that, and with your extremely high passive perception, you hear a shuffling sound um, down the hall. It's outside of your torchlight, but like up ahead of you guys, uh, it, through this cave tunnel, you hear like a shuffling sound. Can guys, I stop? There's, oh, there's a shuffling sound. Uh, uh, it's it's a bit ahead. Uh, can the people who can see in the dark? Do you see anything ahead? Riff looks as much as he can. Me too. The direction. You see a torch moving, a like torch. kind of towards you guys. Can I stop time and go investigate? Yes. I would like to do that, please. Okay. What? <laughs> You, you guys asked for all your things. This is mine. <laughs> confidently, I forgot about that. <laughs> confidently stop time. All of your friends freeze. You see the torch up ahead freeze. It's just floating in air. 
what would you like to do? I would like to carefully walk up. Make an perception check. Not strolling. Okay. Uh, he just uh, types in that cheat code and just boom. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> not, yeah. Right. You guys ask for your things. Um. Hold on. Perception. It's, okay. So twelve. Okay. <laughs> you step in a pit trap and die. You do. Oh, God, are you serious? Uh, make a deck save. <laughs> oh my god, this is... <laughs> it's not a pit trap, but it is a trap. Make a deck uh, save. Jiminy Jellicers, okay. Oh my god, it is not my day. Eight. Okay, you you step on something, and the the floor of the cave shouldn't be rocky or loose, but it is, and your brain's like, oh no, and you go to jump back, but a cage made of solid iron and it's spiked, falls over you and lands. Now, your friends are still in a suspended animation, and the torch light up ahead is still in a suspended animation. You can see... Um, let's see, how far can you see? <laughs> the, I could just see this. The, the, uh, my uh, time, you know, the time piece gets knocked away, and I die of starvation. No. <laughs> You're, you still have the timepiece. Um, thank God, because it's in the end. The torchlight is now from where you are, it's 60 feet away. This is, I had great intentions, everybody. Um, okay. is I, I guess I'm, I'm going to try. Is there a way for me to get through this, get out Absolutely. of this? Absolutely. Go ahead and make a strength check. Or, uh, sorry, athletics check. An athletics Difficulty check. Difficulty 30. I'm sorry, but when we get unfrozen, we're just going to see Humphrey in a cage. 17. <laughs> so, so, yes, you're going to see Humphrey in a cage. But, okay, um, I'm just now, hold on, before I, I admit defeat, I want to see if I have... So, Mage Hand wouldn't be able to be... It's not extra strong. No, it's... Mage Hand is not going to cut it for this. It's a right. heavy iron cage. I have find familiar. I guess my familiar wouldn't necessarily be. Oh, unseen servant. Could that? You're not sure that the unseen servant has the strength to lift this up. Oh, a rope trick. I, 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 fly. No, no, I'm screwed. I'm screwed. Okay. Good talk, everybody. Okay, I'm going to <laughs> just. <laughs> unfreeze time and pretend that this is normal behavior <laughs> okay um, here's what happens all the rest of you one second ago were debating what to do when Durant revealed that there was a torch you guys looked and uh, just a blink later you see 30 feet ahead of you Humphrey is caught in a steel cage God damn and, you Humphrey <laughs> and you see the torch light uh, the torch just drops and you hear the sound of running but it's not the sound of running uh, that like your boots would make it sounds like hooves oh, it's a plopping on, close. on the floor of the cave Tuchel's running as fast as he can to get in front of the, the cage maybe uh, they're coming is, to help that is not hard because you are fast so you get to the cage as you get to the cage, you also see what is running towards you. You see a beast that is nine feet tall with the head of a bull and the body That's of an extremely bull. strong man. And its, its its legs are hooved, its feet are hooved, and it is carrying an ax that is as tall as you are. And it is running forward. And as it's running, it moves in the most fearsome, cowish, moo way that a bull could moo. And I that is where we'll end this episode of D&D with Dan. <laughs> Tune in to find out next week if Tuco lives or dies against the first opponent in the maze of the Sleeping King, the Minotaur. Come on. Um, thanks as always, everybody, for, for liking and subscribing. And uh, thank you to my wonderful cast of, of patrons and all of my supportive patrons. You all uh, make this whole thing happen. So thank you. 
And we will see you guys as soon as we possibly can. All the love, stay healthy, peace. Well, hello, and welcome to Bill Allen World. I am Wizzy, the wizard. I'm back once again to remind you to subscribe and click on the notifications button and also watch videos that are over there. Tune in to the next episode of whatever show you are just watching and watch other shows featuring Bill. He made me say that because he's a narcissist. Okay, bye.